Um, thank you for joining us. I am Lindsay Neffinger, one of the adult services librarians at the Sinsbury Public Library. And on behalf of the library, the Friends of the Library, and Sinsbury Spear Council, we're honored to have Dr. Gretchen Sorn speaking with us this evening about her book, Driving While Black, African-American Travel and the Road to Civil Rights. Before we begin, I'd like to just go over a few housekeeping tips for this webinar format. Please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of the screen if you're on a computer or at the top of your screen if you're on a mobile device such as your phone or um, tablet. The event will be recorded, so if you know someone who is unable to attend, they won't miss out. And questions will be taken after the presentation. Uh, if you are interested in sorry, if you are interested in purchasing your own copy of Dr. Soren's book, we've included a link in the email that was sent out this afternoon. We will also be adding that link into tonight's chat. Um, I'd like to hand it over now to Nkosi, who will explain a bit about Sinsbury Spear Council and then introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Soren. Thank you. All right, um, thank you, um, Lindsay, um, for a, allowing the Spear Council to um, be a, a sponsor with the um, Sinsbury Public Library and being able to be a part of this um, event tonight with, um, Dr., with Dr. Gretchen Soren, with Dr. Soren, we thank you. And so I'm a member of the um, Spirit Council um, that Sinsbury um, Problem Identification and, and um, Resolution of Issues Together. And so we just use that as a, um, as a town council and we've been, you know, our purpose is to, to work on issues of diversity, um, equity, and inclusion for the town of Simsbury. Um, perhaps just to have, you know, conversation topics, you know, with uh, topics that are not um, part of the norm in the town. Um, and just allowing other people to have a, a voice within the town, to have a platform, you know, which allows for collaboration, it allows for growth, um, it allows for ex expansion as well as we just have a, um, you know, a diversity of voices and cultures and experiences um, that are able to, to, um, to speak um, through the Spirit Council. So we've been going strong for um, nearly a year now and we've been doing our monthly um, Let's Talk events through the Simsbury Public Library. And so we are honored you know, to be able to partner with the library um, for our own events and now also for an, a help co-sponsor this one as well. And so um, tonight we were here with um, Dr. Soren, um, the author of Driving While Black, African-American Travel and the Road to Civil Rights. Um, Gretchen Soren is a distinguished professor and director of the Cooperstown Graduate Program of the State University of New York. Um, she has curated countless exhibits, including with the Smithsonian, the Jewish Museum, and the New York State Historical Association and lives in upstate New York. Dr. Soren writes and lectures frequently on museum practice, diversity and inclusion in African American history. Um, we've just been informed by Dr. Soren that um, her book, Driving While Black, has just been, um, is a, a finalist, one of four books is a finalist for the NAACP Image Award. Um, so she's in the nonfiction category with um, a book from Barack Obama, A Promised Land, Michael Eric Dyson, um, um, Elijah Cummings, and another book called The Black Woman's History of the United States. So she knows that's exclusive um, company, but that is a great accomplishment um, for the book. And if you've read the book and you know it, it is worthy for the, um, for the honor that it has been uh, mentioned, you know, mentioned with. It is uh, very, very thorough. So that being said, we're gonna give the floor over to Dr. Soren. Um, again, any questions that you have, you can put them in the Q in a um, section, which is on the bottom of your screen. But first and foremost, we are gonna hear from Dr. Soren. And after she's done with the presentation, we will have the opportunity um, to ask her um, some of the questions from the audience. So thank you. And let's give um, Dr. Soren, I guess if you can, a, a, a virtual applause, but we'll give her the floor. Thank you all. Well, thank you, Nkosi, and 
I'm happy to be here with the Simsbury Public Library, even if, if it has to be virtually. Uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen now. When I see that my friend Peter Roos is in the audience. Hi, Peter. Glad you're here. So this is a story that um, I started on about 20 years ago. Um, it's been a long time. And um, I started thinking about the Negro Motorist's Green Book. A friend showed me a cover of the Negro Motorist's Green Book and asked if I had ever heard of it. And I had not heard of it. And so um, I was intrigued and I really wanted to know more. So I, um, I started digging. And um, the more I dug into the Green Book, the more I realized that my story was really not so much about the Green Book um, but it was really more about the automobile and travel. Um, and then um, it, it's an even bigger story about mobility. So I'd just like to start this evening by playing a little bit of music for you. Philadelphia group. And that last lyric was prayer is your driver's license, faith is your steering wheel. Um, and what I like about those lyrics are the Dixie Hummingbirds are comparing um, in this song called Christian Automobile, they're comparing their Christian faith to the automobile. The automobile was that important in African American life. Uh, for those of you that don't recognize it, this is the Times Square uh, subway station in the days of COVID. Um, and I'm showing it to you because I think that this summer, um, every and spring uh, during the shutdown, everyone really had an opportunity to just get a little bit of a taste of what um, limited mobility was like, what it means when you can't go where you want to go whenever you want to go. <clears throat> and for African Americans, the idea of limited mobility, the idea of prohibited mobility um, begins with slavery. And that's the reason that my story starts um, with the time when the first Africans arrived on these shores and mobility was denied. <coughs> Excuse me. If you wanted to travel during the days of slavery, um, you had to have a pass. Um, and here you can see a typical pass this one um, for Mrs. James Madison, who was the wife of the President of the United States. Um, the pass might look like this, a paper pass, or it might look like this. These were tags that uh, slaves, enslaved people in Charleston had to wear if they were going to be off the master's plantation. So mobility was strictly controlled for African Americans from the very beginning. And so if they wanted the freedom of mobility that all Americans, all other Americans enjoyed, that white Americans enjoyed, they had to steal it. They had to steal their mobility and, and take themselves out of slavery. And this is a painting at the Brooklyn Museum, which is about um, enslaved people running away from slavery. I think it's also important to think about the earliest police departments in the United States. Because the earliest police departments were formed um, by the men and sometimes the women of the community gathering together and patrolling the community at night to make sure that enslaved people were not running away. They were the slave patrols. Here you can see a slave patroller checking the paper pass of a black man that he found out found um, out uh, after dark. And this was very common in many communities in the United States. And these groups, not only were they supposed to catch 
people who were out after dark um, and who were off their plantations or off their farms after dark. And we're talking about both North and South, but they were also there to intimidate, to intimidate the black population and keep them um, from running away or from fomenting um, insurrection. And this is what those uh, slave patrol badges would look like, very much like the current badges that we see um, with our uh, police forces. These were their precursors. Of course, um, African-Americans um, ran, uh, left the South in large numbers beginning in the early 20th century. And this was called the Great Migration. And the Great Migration was really the largest movement of people within this country in the history of the United States. As many as 6 million African-Americans fled the rural South for the urban North. And they were fleeing from poverty. They were fleeing from uh, rural agricultural life, picking cotton and tobacco. And they were fleeing from intimidation and violence. Um, now, many people took public transportation. They fled on uh, buses, they fled in trains, but bus stations and train stations were patrolled. And they were patrolled by people who didn't want African-Americans to leave the South. They didn't want to lose their labor force. They had a labor force that was very poorly paid and that um, made a lot of money for a lot of people in the South. And therefore, they wanted to keep those people working, keep those people picking cotton, keep those people ignorant. And so it was much better if you could, if you had a friend up North who had a car, if you could possibly pile all of your belongings into that car at night and sneak out of the South under cover of darkness. Now public transportation um, was not only, it wasn't only dangerous to try and get North on public transportation, but if you were just traveling around on public transportation, it was humiliating. You had to sit, as we know, in the back of the bus um, you, everything was the waiting rooms, the bathrooms were segregated. Um, African-Americans found that these arrangements were humiliating. Bus drivers often had guns and they treated African-Americans incredibly harshly and often with violence. Um, and this is a, a, a train car that was also segregated. You can see the, the bench seats in the back for, for black people. Um, Segregated trains were crowded, they were dirty, they were rarely cleaned, the bathrooms were filthy. Usually they put the black train car right behind the engine, um, which would be belching out smoke that would go into the car. So it was very unpleasant. Of course, for white passengers, there was a much more spacious car uh, or cars, uh, much more pleasant travel situation. So black people didn't like public transportation. That's one of the reasons that the automobile is such a wonderful um, artifact for African-Americans because they can go where they wanna go, when they wanna go. Um, and they don't have to face the humiliation of the segregated train and the segregated bus, the cruelty of the bus driver or even the violence. Um, so African-Americans start buying cars in large numbers when they can. And as they move North, and gain more disposable income, they're able to purchase automobiles. So that by the 1950s, African-Americans are consuming uh, automobiles and travel just as they were consuming other consumer goods like percolators and television sets and refrigerators. Um, and one of the things that about my research that I thought was particularly interesting was the way that the type of car, the make of car that you purchased was tied to your identity. Um, the cars that black people tended to drive were large, heavy, um, expensive cars. And there were several reasons for this. For one thing, you might have to sleep in your car because hotels were segregated and often they were not available. So people carried blankets and pillows in their cars in case they had to sleep in the car. You might have to carry all of your food. People carried large of those big, heavy uh, Coleman coolers in their cars filled with food, sometimes for multiple days because you couldn't stop at a restaurant. You just couldn't stop at a restaurant and eat. Um, you might carry extra cans of gasoline because you didn't know if you would be able to stop at a gas station. 
Um, you didn't know where you would be welcome, where people were willing to sell to you. You might carry um, extra gallons of water for the radiator or even things like extra fan belts or other uh, parts that you think you might need for your car. <clears throat> so your car had to be well stocked, just like your home did um, with all of the supplies that you might need on the road, just in case, because you never know what you um, might encounter. So I think of the automobile as your rolling living room. It was, it had to be comfortable so you could sleep in it. It had to be able to accommodate your family. Um, it had to have, uh, it had to be heavy so that an angry mob would have a hard time turning it over. It had to have lots of trunk space. So uh, what you're looking at is the Buick Electra and the Buick was the most popular choice for African-Americans. Um, and this is the Buick Electra, which was a very luxurious car. Um, the ad says, all the Electra lacks is a fireplace. And here you can see a, just a family snapshot of a family who was stopped by the side of the road to enjoy some refreshments, to enjoy their lunch with their trunk open and their picnic basket and a uh, cooler of liquid, uh, to dr something to drink um, in the back. Um, of course, there's a, there are stereotypes about African-Americans and Cadillacs. Oh, that African-Americans bought Cadillacs or that Black people bought Cadillacs um, when they couldn't, um, they, they couldn't even own a house, but they would buy a Cadillac. Well, there was a reason that African-Americans in many neighborhoods couldn't own a house. And it was that realtors and banks colluded to prevent African-Americans from getting mortgages. And so there were many times that African-Americans couldn't buy houses because their, their neighborhoods were redlined. If you couldn't buy a house, you put your, um, your disposable income into the next largest family purchase, and that would be your car. Um, also, many entertainers like Chuck Berry seen here could afford Cadillacs and they wanted beautiful Cadillacs. Uh, Chuck Berry in his lifetime owned many Cadillacs. But one of them is at the Smithsonian um, Museum now. Um, but African-Americans didn't buy Cadillacs in any larger numbers than white Americans. About 3% of white Americans bought Cadillacs, 3% of African-Americans bought Cadillacs. This is Medgar Evers, who is an NAACP field secretary, and his job was very dangerous. He had to drive to the site of lynchings and drive to the site of places where churches had been burned. Um, he was out in the uh, rural areas that were very isolated. And he chose for his car, the Rocket 88. Um, now the Oldsmobile 88 was a fast car, a very powerful car with a very powerful engine. And he chose this car because if you just touch the accelerator, it takes off. Now he might have to outrun um, an angry mob or outrun a pickup truck that was chasing him. Um, and so it was important for him to have a fast responsive car. Um, he was also a very tall man, so this was a car that he could sleep in if he needed to, and he kept blankets and pillows in his car as well. And of course, we know that Medgar Evers was shot next to his car um, when he pulled into his driveway, um, the driveway of his home in 1963. Um, and this is, here you can see um, a beautiful 1930 uh, Cadillac parked on a street in Harlem. Um, this, of course, um, the automobile was just for, as it was for other Americans, it was a status symbol as well. And as African Americans um, gained more disposable income and were able to get good jobs in the North, um, it was a lot of, it was very important for them to be able to take their cars and, and drive home to their families if they were from the South and show them how successful they had become in the North. But this is just one really spectacular automobile. <clears throat> I'd like you to think a minute for, about the intersection of race and space. Think about what it was like um, to live in a world before the automobile. Most people in that time period didn't go anywhere. They stayed put. They didn't go more than a mile or two from home. So if you think about it, um, you would you would. Think about the towns 
in Massachusetts or in upstate New York or in Vermont that are about 10 miles apart, 12 miles apart in rural areas. Every town has its own general store. Every town has its own library. Every town has its own post office. And these towns might only be seven or 10 miles apart. And that was because people didn't go very far. Everybody stayed within their own community. But the automobile changes that and it opens up the space in the country in ways that it hadn't been opened up before. And people are crisscrossing the country on highways and they're going great distances. Um, this is a, a particularly lovely uh, snapshot of two little girls on Easter Sunday. But when African-Americans go out on the road and when they're leaving their communities um, to travel across the country, they're encountering, encountering landscapes that are fraught with very negative messages. Um, things like um, road signs, like this one, which says um, Realm of National Alabama, it's a, it's a welcome to Klan country sign. And at the, at the entrance to the state of North Carolina, there is a huge billboard that says welcome to, that said welcome to Klan country. This is the poster for a chain of um, fast food restaurants on the West Coast throughout California. Um, it's, a, it's a chain that started in Salt Lake City um, and it's the Coon Chicken Inn and you entered the restaurant through the giant coon's mouth. Um, and so you can imagine what it was like to be traveling with your children and trying to um, show your children the country um, and talk about what the country was about and being faced with these incredibly demeaning and racist images. Visitors to Greenville, Texas saw this banner across the main street. Welcome to Greenville, the blackest land, the whitest people. Now Greenville did not have a very good um, reputation. There had been some lynchings in Greenville in the early, early 20th century. So for African-Americans traveling and coming into Greenville, it was quite terrifying to see this across the main street and these words, were also painted onto the, the town water tower. And sadly, all across the United States, there were sundown towns. Now, a sundown town was a town that African-Americans could be in during the day. They could work in sundown towns, but they had to leave um, before the sun went down. And here you can see a sign uh, many of the sundown towns had a sign at either entrance, um, letting people know that you better be out of town by the town by the time the sun goes down. There was even one town in the Midwest that had a siren that went off at six o'clock, signaling black people to be out of town or to, to leave town at that time. And there were hundreds of these sundown towns. Um, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, Darien, Connecticut, um, Palm Beach, Florida. These were all sundown towns and there were many, many more. And many African-Americans also encountered violence as they traveled. So although the automobile gave them great freedom um, and privacy, it also was fraught with danger. And this is the slide. <laughs> of a, uh, a county fair in Colorado. And you can see that everyone at the fair was wearing um, a Klan robe. So imagine encountering this group if you were traveling and just wanted to visit a fair. So in 1936, a man named Victor Green, who had had a bad travel experience, decided that he was going to start a book, a booklet. Um, published annually called the Negro Motorist Screen Book. And it was produced in New York City. I happen to think that he called it the Green Book because his name was Green, but I think he called it the Green Book because the AAA guide was called the Blue Book. And the Blue Book was useless for African-Americans. And so Green created a guide that was good for African-Americans called the Green Book. There had been other travel guides before Green's um, booklet. There were travel guides after Green's booklet, but this one was the most uh, long lasting of the travel guides lasting until 1966. And it listed alphabetically by state, places, 
that black people could visit and be welcome when they traveled. So places like hotels, motels, restaurants, um, places to get your car fixed, uh, places to have fun like nightclubs, um, service stations, and even places like pharmacies, barbershops, and um, beauty parlors. Victor Green borrowed some words from Mark Twain, uh, travel is fatal to prejudice. Um, that appears in Mark Twain's book, The uh, Innocence Abroad. Um, and that became his mantra for the Green Book. And he talked about it frequently in the Green Book. He wanted, uh, he wanted people to travel the, the country and see the country. And he felt that if white people encountered black people, that would reduce prejudice. And that was his goal. He wanted to put his Green Book out of business. Here you see Victor and Alma Green. And I show you Alma because Victor Green um, gets sick in the late 1950s and Alma takes over as the head of the Green Book, even though Victor Green remains the, remains the figurehead. Um, and she manages the publishing company with four women. Um, and so it's a wholly woman owned and operated um, public publishing company from that time onward. So I think that is uh, very important because women were important in this story as well as men. And many of the places in the Green Book were um, private homes that had an extra room. So if a, if a woman had an extra room in her home, she might rent out that room and make it available to travelers um, and provide them with a meal, a, a breakfast and or a dinner. And so these were, many of these places were early, early bed and breakfasts. Victor Green had agents all over the United States who helped him identify these places um, that were welcoming to African-Americans. Um, many of them were people who worked for historically black colleges, but had traveling musicians. And those musicians, of course, when they were out on the road had to have places to stay. And so Victor Green mined um, that resource and he collected all of these places. He also used word of mouth. He asked the traveling public, the traveling black public <clears throat> to report to him when they had stayed and had a good experience. And he would put those places in the green book as well. Um, but the most important thing I think about the longevity of the green book was the partnership that Green established with Esso Gasoline, um, which was part of Standard Oil. Um, Esso uh, and Standard Oil were owned by the Rockefeller family and the Rockefellers were deeply religious um, Baptists and they believed in equality. They believed deeply in equality. And so um, they also believed in enlightened self-interest. And so they permitted African-Americans to use the bathrooms at Esso gas stations. And because they were permitted to use the bathrooms, African-Americans, whenever they could, bought Esso gasoline. Um, and Green was also distributing his green books at SO gas stations. Um, and Standard Oil purchased large quantities of uh, green books to, to hand out to their customers. Green was anxious to, to court the black middle class. And you can see here from this 1948 cover of the green book, uh, he's got a, a very attractive black couple on the cover with matched luggage. And you can see their suburban house in the background, a little bit of their car. Um, this is a time period when African American uh, African Americans are starting to have more disposable income. They're entering the middle class in large numbers, and you also have the first African American executives of major American corporations being hired, and they are traveling. <clears throat> and as they are traveling, they're finding that they can't stay in the same hotels and they can't eat in the same restaurants as their white counterparts. So the Negro Motorist Green Book is absolutely essential for them when they traveled. Uh, and as I, as I mentioned, the Green Book was not the only travel guide. There were um, travel uh, instructions in the backs of newspapers and black magazines. Um, there were many, many other guides. This happens to have been a travel map uh, in 1942 that was produced um, by the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper. And you can see it includes 342 hotels and guest houses, um, as well as colored YMCAs. So places 
places for people to stay um, across this one in across the Northeast. And there were many different types of places for people to, to um, spend the night. This is a, a colored YMCA dorm room. You could stay, young men could stay for, for weeks at a time. Uh, as I mentioned, there were many uh, women who rented out their, their extra rooms to make money for their families. Um, and this is Rock Rest um, on the rocky coast of Maine, which was a, a tourist home um, that people would go for the summer um, and spend a week or two at a time. Um, and here you can see Rock Rest. And now architecturally, it's really a basic New England cottage that's had dormer, a large dormer, those three windows um, above the front door, um, a large dormer added to it. Um, it was off the beaten path because they were not permitted to buy land right on the beach. Um, but it was a place that was very, very popular for many years. Um, <clears throat> Hazel Sinclair was a great cook and a great New England cook. And she used to make these incredible lobster um, dinners um, and luncheons for um, African-American middle-class ladies like you see here. But she also catered for the white community as well. So um, this was a, a typical of the kind of thriving African-American businesses across the country that were catering to black travelers. Um, but there were also luxury hotels. Um, the, my, my greatest complaint about the movie, The Green Book, was that all of the places that they show as being in the Green Book are dumps because it, it serves the story well that they're um, really terrible places. But there were African-American luxury hotels like this one here. This is the Hotel Teresa um, in New York City. This is the hotel that Castro, Fidel Castro stayed in when he came to New York. Um, it's still standing. It's no longer a hotel. It's an office, uh, office building. Um, but there were luxury hotels in a variety of cities around the country that African-Americans could stay in. And of course, um, this is the time period of the motel. Um, these were right off the major highways and you could pull your car right up to your door um, and the next morning uh, after you spent the night at the motel, you could get right back on the highway easily. <clears throat> the Green Book um, had uh, just listings of hotels and restaurants and, and garages, but it also had display ads. And many of the display ads, like the one you see here, showed the proprietor, the owner of the restaurant or the owner of the, um, of the business. And I think the reason for that was to make sure that African-Americans knew that this was a black owned business and this was a place that you could feel confident and comfortable that you would be welcome as you were traveling along the road. <clears throat> the other thing that, these, um, that the Green Book did for these businesses was it provided national marketing for many of these mom and pop businesses. As this network of black businesses grew up across the country, um, there, this was a place you went to the Green Book and you, uh, it really marketed these places and, and provided a place for black people to find um, these businesses. Uh, I wanted to mention the, the national parks because I think it's very important. The National Park Service, even today, has been doing research on why Black people don't visit the national parks. Well, Black people don't visit the national parks in large numbers because they don't like going out into the wilderness. They are um, afraid of who they might encounter um, in the wilderness, perhaps with guns. Um, and as one of the people in our movie documentary said, you know, um, he, he's concerned about their trees there are trees in the wilderness and ropes hang from trees. So um, the, the national parks, although they were open and always have been open to African-Americans because they're on federal property, not state property, um, but the, the concessions within the national parks are privately owned and operated. So the guest houses, the cabins, uh, the restaurants are privately operated and as a result, many, many of them were segregated. So you could drive all the way from Massachusetts or New Jersey out to Grand Teton or to Yellowstone or to Yosemite 
and find that you were, even though you could get into the park, you were still staying in a, in a filthy subpar um, segregated um, place when you got there. Um, for me, one of the most important aspects of the automobile and um, African-Americans is the important role that the automobile played in, in the civil rights movement. And what you're looking at here is an advertisement in the Green Book for Ware's Market in which the proprietor, C.E. Ware, has, has tied himself to Martin Luther King um, and to Ralph Abernathy. So um, at his own peril, of course. Oh, and this is a, a, a march that took place in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and the man at the front of the line who are holding the equal opportunity and human dignity sign um, will soon be taken back to the Gaston Motel in Birmingham. And when he does, he finds that the Gaston Motel has been bombed. When you think about the civil rights movement, all of the people that went south, both black and white, had to have places to stay and they had to have pl places to eat. And the hotel and motels that supported African-American travelers also supported the civil rights movement. They provided um, bail money for many people who were arrested during the civil rights and they provided food and shelter. Um, and the Gaston Motel, uh, the, this was a very dangerous thing to do. And the Gaston Motel um, ended up being bombed. <clears throat> this is the Perkins Microbus. It's a uh, obviously a Volkswagen bus, and it was used to drive around a county in South Carolina and to register voters um, and to bring health care and to um, bring education, to teach people. They offered workshops on how to pass the poll test. Um, it, if you think about how large a county is or how large a state is, there is no way that you could cover an entire state to register voters uh, or entire state to bring, say, a vaccination program for children um, out to the people without a vehicle. You had to have a car. And that's what this vehicle was used for, as, as were many other vehicles. They, they were needed in order to register voters. But perhaps most importantly, in boycotts, African Americans needed vehicles to bring um, people to work. Um, here is a slide from the Montgomery bus boycott. You can see Martin Luther King on the right ushering these women into an automobile. Um, the King purchased a fleet of cars and these cars were used to drive people to work so that they didn't lose their jobs and they didn't have to take the bus. And that was the way that they were able to bankrupt the bus company. And here you can see the fleet of cars, these station wagons um, that they purchased to drive people to work. So the automobile was crucial to the Montgomery bus boycott and to other boycotts in the South um, that were attempting to desegregate buses. So at the same time, that there was direct action going on in the streets, there was also action going on in the courts. And the NAACP and the Urban League were suing the major hotel chains like Hilton and Howard Johnson's to open up to African-American travelers. And here you can see a demonstration outside of a Hilton hotel. Um, in 1964, the civil rights legislation passed uh, by President Johnson um, ends segregation in public accommodations. And all of these hotel chains, the national hotel chains, open up to African-American travelers. When that happens, African-Americans go to these hotels because they can, because they've worked so hard to open them. And what happens is a lot of the black businesses go out of business. So where are we today? This is Philando Castile, who was stopped more than 20 times um, by the police um, for driving while black before he was murdered by the police with his uh, girlfriend and baby in the car. And of course, you remember um, George Floyd 
excuse me, who was murdered this um, in May. Uh, he was dragged out of his car and murdered by a police officer. So driving remains a dangerous activity for African Americans in the United States, often because they are perceived as being in the wrong place, um, a place they're not supposed to be in because they're black. So if you think about Ahmed Aubrey, who was murdered by two or three white men because he was jogging in a, in a space that was perceived to be a white space, a space he wasn't supposed to be in, we still see that mobility is an issue for black people in America. So handy hints for drivers stopped by the police. Be courteous, obey all lawful orders, have license and registration ready. Oh, and avoid being black. And I would be happy now to entertain your questions. So while we give them just a moment or two to write those in, uh, we can touch upon some of the questions that Nkosi and I have worked on this week, which, oh, there he is, coming back, perfect. Um, one of the things that stuck out to me as a librarian is that this book was extensively cited. So I wondered how long it took to write and research this, this book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, as I said, I started the research 20 years ago and I was, you know, on and off doing the research for it for a long time. Um, the actual writing probably took me um, a year, the writing, after I had all of the research in hand. Any question that things stick out to you the most that you'd like to touch upon? Oh, I'll say that again. Was that a question to me or was that Nkosi? Nkosi, I think he's looking through the questions right now. Ah, okay. well, yeah, I have a question as well. Um, some of the things that stood out, even in the um, like in the, your presentation, the pictures, like you seen like um, Chuck Berry uh, leaning on his Cadillac, um, or even just the um, the symbolism of having an an automobile. And so I, I was wondering like, how much was the automobile um, seen as a threat perhaps by the white society, almost as a threat to that, um, to supremacy or as a threat, you know, to, to, to the, the caste that is, you know, most um, African-Americans are relegated to. Um, I think uh, the automobile, it's, it's a little bit complicated because one of the um, jobs that was acceptable for African-Americans to have, according to white people, was driving. It was acceptable for you to be a driver or a chauffeur. So when they, um, when white people saw black people driving, that was okay. The, the thing that disturbed some people was when African-Americans were driving a fancy car. Mm -hmm. so when you're driving um, a Cadillac or a really nice Buick, that was upsetting to some people. Oh, he's got a car better than me. Why does he have a car better than me? It was interesting. Um, um, a man recently wrote to me and told me a story about seeing the police stop a black man who was driving a Mercedes and they stopped him and, and they got him out of the car and asked him why he was, um, you know, why, why he was just sitting there. He was just sitting in his car waiting for his wife to come from a meeting. And they wanted, they got him out and they wanted to know why he was there. And he said, well, I'm waiting for my wife. She's inside, she's at a meeting. And they asked him whose car it was because he's in a Mercedes. And he said it was his car. And they said, well, what do you do for a living? And he said he was a surgeon. And they mocked him and said, you, you're a surgeon? You know, like, really? So, you know, this was the police. Uh, and the, the, the man that wrote, wrote the story to me was a white man who was also sitting in his car, but the police didn't ask him anything. They didn't stop him. They didn't get him out. He was also waiting for his wife. It was a meeting the two women were um, the two women were at. So, it, you know, it, it's still happening in this country and it's, it's very sad. Okay. One piece that also stuck out to, I'm sure, in Coach Q is that Connecticut was mentioned a few times in the book. 
Mm -hmm. um, one also in your talk this evening about uh, Darien being a sundown town. Yes. When most people think of sundown towns, they generally think of the southern, the south. So that's not accurate. I would say most of the sundown towns were in the Midwest. Okay. Illinois and Indiana, um, lots and lots of sundown towns. Um, in, in Ohio, uh, there were lots of places. And it's interesting because I've gotten um, people asking me questions today about why, why don't black people live in, it was a Manitowoc. People ask me, why aren't black people living in Manitowoc today? Why are there so few? Well, these places have reputations you know, as, as being unwelcoming and inhospitable and scary as places that, you know, black people could not live. If you think about um, uh, Levittown on Long Island, uh, Levittown, when the first black family moved in, they had rocks thrown through their windows. They had, you know, they had crosses burned on their lawn. Um, Levittown didn't have a sign that said it was a sundown town, but it was essentially a sundown community um, because they, you know, so intimidated and, and um, uh, hassled the families, the black families that, that tried to move in there. So we did have a few questions coming in and coach, can you see those too? Yeah, I see um, one of the questions here is from Sandra. She asked, why do you think only um, men are stopped in cars? I'm saying African-American men, I'm assuming, are stopped in cars and not so much African-American women. Oh, I think women are stopped. I've been, I've been stopped by the police for no reason. Um, I think that there is a, uh, I, I guess one of, one of my, um, our film editor talks about hypermasculinity you know, that, that white police officers seem to be intimidated, male, male police officers seem to be intimidated by black men and perceive of black men as criminals. And a lot of the training materials that are used to train police, the videos use black people and black and brown people as the perpetrators. Yeah. So if you've been trained to, to think that the perpetrators of crime are black and brown, then you're going to, you're going to see things that are not there. You're going to see, oh, he must be a criminal because he's a black or brown person. And I think that's one of the, um, one of the big problems is the training of police officers. And I even saw that some of the police officers, when they do their target shooting, their, their targets are black men. You know, that's what they have when they're doing their they're shooting of when they're doing their, their police, you know, they're at the gun range, I guess, for the, um, for the police. So when you say that about their training, that just really triggered, um, triggered that. And I've read that as well. Um, we have um, another question. Um, one question is from Anne. She was asking about the um, incident that you uh, mentioned with the black surgeon, the Mercedes. She was asking, where did that um, happen? <clears throat> That's a good question because I don't remember. <laughs> You know what, um, since I, I wrote an article that appeared in Motor Trend Magazine, and since I wrote that article, people have been just writing to me and telling me their stories. Right. And that was one of the stories that was, was written to me. And I have to be honest, I saved it, but I don't remember where it was. Okay. All right. Um, we have another question from- In California. I think it was in California, but I'm, I'm not positive. We have a um, question from Suzanne um, Bailey. She was asking him in regards to the um, the sunset towns. What did black workers do if it's if it's winter time? You know, when you're at work, was there some sort of exceptions to these rules, or you had to still, you know, you know, hightail out of town even if it's winter and the sun goes down earlier? Yeah, you had to hightail it out of town. That was exactly right. Um, I I interviewed a, a man who was the driver for the Salzberger family. They're the people that own the New York Times. And he used to drive the family uh, from New York City to Florida every um, every summer. Um, and actually, I think they went. In, I think they went in the winter. That that is right. And he would drive them to to um, Palm Beach, and he was not allowed to stay in their complex in their house mm. because he was black. He had to go to West Palm Beach, where black people. So all the all the maids, all the butlers, all the servants had to go to West Palm Beach. They had to get out of Palm Beach because Palm Beach was only for white people. 
and they had to go to West Palm Beach. So that was one of the stories um, that I was told. So there, there wasn't a sign um, in Palm Beach that said black people were not allowed, but black people were not allowed. And it was very strictly enforced. The same thing is true of Miami Beach. Miami, um, you, black people were allowed to be in Miami and there was a black luxury hotel called the Hampton Inn in Miami, but Miami Beach was uh, segregated and, and black people were not allowed to be on Miami uh, Beach or in the hotels there. Um, so no sign, but it was interesting because Cassius Clay, when he fought in Miami, he couldn't, he couldn't stay at the hotel in Miami Beach. He, so he stayed at the Hampton House, um, Hampton House Inn, uh, which was in Miami, not the beach. Okay, wow. Um, another question that we have, thank you, says, have you received any feedback, you know, from the towns or companies that you identify in your book for making travel difficult for Black people? Actually, yes. <clears throat> I have um, been talking to the people at the American Automobile Association who are very concerned about their, um, the history of their company. Um, and we've actually had some really positive support. And if you, if you look at the documentary film that's based on my book, um, General Motors is supporting the documentary film. Mm -hmm. So after the film came out, um, and of course the film talks about the Buick, the Buick is a General Motors product. <laughs> It talks about how much black people loved Buicks right. and Cadillacs. Those are both General Motors products. Um, and General Motors is now supporting the, um, supporting the film. So wow. I would say those two companies, definitely. All right, GM. And so another question from Barbara Wolf. She says, most white people did not know what the Green Book was until the movie Green Book. Yet that movie seemed to focus more on the white man who was hired to drive the car. So do you think that Hollywood is beginning to finally believe that movies focused on Black people can market to all people? Yes, I think so. I think the, the problem with that movie was that it was, it was told from the perspective of the white person because it was made by the white man's family. Mm. It was made by his son. Um, the, you know, I mean, it's a true story to, as far as it goes. Um, it, it's true that uh, he was the driver, his father was the driver for the musician. Um, parts of it though are, are just grossly fabricated, but it's, it's told from his perspective, the white man's perspective. Right. Oh yes, I think, <clears throat> I think they've seen, uh, Hollywood is starting to see that they sh perhaps should have more black writers and more black um, people involved in, in filmmaking. I hope that happens. All people of other colors, more women, you know, just more diversity in their filmmaking. Black Panther kind of showed us yeah. that that could be popular. Yeah. Fruitvale Station, Black Panther. Yeah. Um, another question we have is from Karina. And it says, Dr. Soren, as an educator, I would like to know what you feel should be taught specifically to high school college students to give them a truer understanding of the history and experiences you describe? Um, well, I would say that Driving While Black has been um, adopted by several high schools um, and they're using it as a, as a senior, junior and senior reading. So I think that's a good start. Um, I really think that, that um, we, need, we really need to uh, rewrite textbooks. Yeah. I think textbooks, um, kind of gloss over history and they, they want to prettify it. Um, and I guess as, as my colleague um, Craig Wilder says, we, we need to address history with a brutal honesty. Um, and that's, that's really the way to make things better in this country. And I, I think we've seen that Americans don't know our history. Um, and there were, an example of it was on the 6th of January when we saw um, that that horrible, disgraceful demonstration, well, it wasn't a demonstration, insurrection um, in Washington, D.C. And listening to what people had to say was grossly, um, that showed gross ignorance of American history. All right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. 
and I, the, part of your, your book in, in dealing with issues with travel and I guess the inequity that if you're white and had access to anywhere in society, but if you're African-American or perhaps needing a pass or you know, not having that same freedom you know, to travel, you know, kind of had me thinking about issues even perhaps like with the, the Black Panthers or with the Second Amendment, that there's something that um, is something that's written in the Constitution. But if you're a person of color, some things you're, you're thinking twice about as how to exercise, you know, your, that, that right. And so when you talk about the, um, the insurrection on January 6th, mm -hmm. that was a big topic. If there's a Black Lives Matter, you know, um, if black men had had done what those white men did um, with guns, they would have been mowed down immediately. Right. <laughs> they would have just been, they would have all been killed. Right. We know that's the case. Wouldn't even been a question. Yeah. All right. Um, another question from an attendee. What sort of policy changes might help on the local, state, and or national level to address continued racism on the road? Um, one of the things that I think, I think we need uh, more training and better training of police. I also think we need to decriminalize um, traffic stops so that traffic stops are not, if somebody has a broken tail light or a broken headlight or their turn signal's not working, um, you do not need to be stopped by a man with a gun right. for, for a broken signal. You need you need either a warning or you need a ticket, but it doesn't need to come from a man with a gun. It needs to be a person that is enforcing traffic uh, laws, not a person that is there to enforce um, criminal behavior. Um, and so I would say some cities um, are, are thinking about experimenting with traffic control that is not um, done by the police. I also think we need to think about um, handling mental situations where there's mental illness involved. You know, what can the police do? The police can arrest you. The police can shoot you. They can put you in jail. But for mental illness, we need to, um, you know, send out people that, that know how to deal with the mentally ill. Right. And we just saw that case where the um, police were... I guess in the grand jury found him not guilty with the man they put the spit rag over his yeah, head. In Rochester, New York. In, in New York, thank you. Yeah. So that is very, um, very re relevant, relevant to today. Um, I was um, also from the, the book when you talked about with the black middle class and I guess the, the recognition, the understanding of black buying power and then how that could relate to um, boycotts and not... Um, um, offering their, you know, their, their funds to companies that they deemed as, you know, not friendly to African Americans. So I was something that, you know, kind of caught my attention because it seems like the word, you know, boycott or sacrifice is hard for today, but it seemed like the automobile and just having that or the, the extra income or the disposable income, um, words like boycott, it sounded like was allowed to be used a little bit more frequently um, if we weren't happy with services. Yeah, I think um, various communities organized boycotts to make sure that companies were hiring people of color, that they were treating people equitably uh, when they purchased their products. And, um, you know, the Tasty Cake was boycotted in, in Philadelphia because they weren't allowing African Americans to work for the company and they changed their tune. Um, I, I, you know, with, with automobiles, African Americans bought Fords because Henry Ford was willing to hire them to work in the automobile factories mm -hmm. and they could make as much as $5 a day, um, which was a lot of money then, um, working, making cars. Um, but, uh, but American Jews do not buy Fords because Ford was a raving anti-Semite. Wow. So your identity is tied certainly to consumer products and the black newspapers for years um, did surveys of consumer products asking black people, what products do you buy? Mm -hmm. And then they would advertise, go to those companies and say, we just want you to know that X percentage of our um, population buys gold medal flour or X percentage of our population 
buys Morton Salt to make those companies aware of the fact that they had black consumers and they needed to um, you know, be responsive to those consumers. Right. Yeah, that's um, man, the boycott. I think you kind of see the NBA players. They they were kind of, you know, um, used their position a little bit, you know, over the um the past NBA season as far as hey, we're not even playing, you know, or these games tonight because we're just not happy with the state of, or in this case, it was police brutality, but racial affairs. Like this is, you know, this is out of control, and so they were taking control you know, of what they could and being able to say, we're, we're, boy, we're not playing tonight. That's right. The boy, boycotts, boycotts do work, especially if you can, you know, if you can get a lot of support behind them. That's all right. All right. So still... We do have one more question before we wrap up. Um, uh, Wendy was wondering if there are still vacation spots that Black people avoid that stem from the Green Book, like the national parks. Interesting. Um, apparently there are, and I don't, I don't know what those places might be other than the places that have a reputation for being unfriendly to African Americans, um, like some of the cities in the Midwest. Um, and the reason I know that, why do I know that? <laughs> um, I, know, I know that because I talked to the folks at TripAdvisor and they, they, told me that there are places that African-Americans avoid. I know one of the places is the Adirondacks. Um, and if you, I, I don't know how many of you've been to the Adirondacks, but the Adirondacks is a, is a beautiful, enormous park. Um, it's, it's hundreds of miles uh, in upstate New York and it's wilderness. Um, but there are uh, communities there with museums and arts organizations and um, African-Americans don't go to the Adirondacks. And I think the reason black people don't go to the Adirondacks is because when you drive up there, you see a lot of Confederate flags. Mm -hmm. And so that does not create a very welcoming environment if you're black. So yes, I'm sure there are places um, all over the country that African-Americans that either have a, a long reputation as being unfriendly to black people or that you can clearly see are, um, places that black people would 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 fear like like the Adirondack um, the Adirondack Park in New York um, so yes okay. all right um, want to thank you again for spending this evening with us we are truly appreciative thank you Nikosi for moderating with your amazing grace as usual he moderates all of our let's talks events and he's amazing at it so it was a perfect fit for this evening the recording we have tonight will be shared on SCTV for the, our local access station for a period of time. And we will also be adding it to the library's YouTube channel for a period of time as well. So if you know someone who was unable to make it, they will have a chance to see. Um, thank you again. And uh, any last thoughts from either one of you before we head our separate ways this evening? I'll just say to you, um, Dr. Soren, just thank you again for joining us. Thank you for this, I guess, the, the academic work, but just as well as the, you know, the historical and anecdotal work that goes along um, with your book. And I found it to be just very timely with, you know, the events that are happening in society today. So we keep seeing how history can and will repeat itself. And so I just find that your book was very, very timely you know, and just, you know, exposing a lot and how it connects a lot to the things we're seeing today. So I just want to say thank you. For well, that. thank you for inviting me. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Take care. Good night. Good night, Lindsay. Good night, Cozy. See you right. next week. That's <laughs> it.